Other than during the annual athletics championship, sex did not play much of an obvious part in the daily life of the school. Nevertheless, there were figures amongst the staff who exuded sexuality. Jamaica is a society of dominant women. History has ensured that this is so. Jamaican women not only hold families together and often bring up children without any support, but they also constitute 75% of the student population, 80% of the teachers, and most of the administrative workers in banks and the public services. Young women may be frequently abused both on the streets and at home, but a woman with qualifications and a salary is a person to be respected, admired, and by young male students, feared. Some of the women teachers were very attractive and didn't mind if the men and boys were aware of it. Displaying magnificent thighs and rounded bottoms in short split leather miniskirts and impressive bosoms in flimsy cotton blouses with plunging necklines, such women came into school with the intention of making the men and boys defer to their sexual power. For these were truly the queens and the males merely their subjects. My immediate boss was a Mrs Hart. She would conduct meetings with the teachers in her team as would a medieval queen hold court. She spoke so calmly and with such authority that all her minions could do was nod in assent. I would stare at anything other than her bosom, her belly, her bottom. At one point, during a meeting, I made a determined effort to speak. The hairs on my head tingled with embarrassment. I could not look for more than two seconds at Mrs Hart. I gave up because I had forgotten what I was trying to say. I knew, in any case, that I would have to obey her without question. I did so, and so did the boys. In her lessons there was a complete silence. All the boys focused hard on their books till the end of the lesson. Mrs Hart's control was absolute, and we all knew it. Come with me. I know a place we could be free as Find to spend some time with you, getting to really know you. Kingston College was a large school of some 2,000 pupils, of whom only one was white. So, as the only white teacher, I was something of a novelty. Most of my colleagues never saw me as anything else. To them, I was just the white man or the Englishman. One gentleman greeted me daily with the words, Bit hot for you, eh? After nine months I had grown weary of the question. Several other teachers addressed me as James instead of Michael. One day I asked what I had done to deserve this name. Well, came the reply, the Englishman last year was called James, and we are just used to it. What did he look like? I inquired. He was short and stout, with grey hair and blue eyes. But I'm not short or stout, and I have dark hair and brown eyes. Yes, but we get used to it, you know. Anyway, what's so wrong with James? Well, they might have got used to it, but I never did. 
I was suffering from being seen as a stereotype. This had never happened to me before, and I felt a sudden sympathy for those people who had experienced the same indignity in Britain. For those who haven't and don't know, it feels as if you are permanently in a glass cage and no one can get through to you and you cannot reach anyone. It's a very isolating experience. Even so, I knew that the situation I was facing was a lot easier than for immigrants to England. It's a lot easier to show people that you are really one of the lads than to have to be constantly proving to others that you're not as low and inferior as they evidently think you are. Nevertheless, I was very grateful for anything which might help break through the barriers that I felt separating me from the rest of the staff. After several months at the school, a woman teacher who was working alongside me in the staff room asked me if she could touch my hair. Of course, I said, as long as I can touch yours. The hair-stroking exchange caused much general amusement and the glass cage began to crack just a fraction. Yet, I knew that I was going to have to work very hard if I was to break it completely. I asked if I could give a talk about education in England. Most of the staff dutifully attended, expecting I have no doubt to be lectured to about the superiority of the English educational system. I told them the truth, as I saw it, about the education that 90% of English students actually received. I told them about the reality of secondary schools in England, what it was like to teach at an inner London comprehensive, how most children still left school poorly qualified at 16 years old and that only one in five stood a realistic chance of getting into a university. I realised that they had only heard of Oxford and Cambridge, Eton and Harrow, and that they somehow imagined that all the English were products of these hallowed institutions. I told them that the children of all those Jamaicans who had migrated to England were receiving an education that was designed for the working masses and not the elite. It was a system that had been developed to ensure that children should be sufficiently literate, numerate and socialised to be able to work in a factory without causing too much trouble. Those factories, I explained, were now closing down and many of the children who might have worked in them were now educated for nothing and faced only unemployment. I told them about the riots in London only a year before and that these riots were a direct result of the disappointment and disillusion with the education system. When I finished, a member of staff stood up and thanked me. He said that he had wanted to hear the truth for a long time and that now he had a much better idea of what was going on over there. He ended by saying, So, we would like to thank Michael for his talk. He was telling us straight. Yes, Michael, he said, turning to me. You're coming like a real Jamaican now. After that, I felt as if the glass cage that I had been in was not there anymore. Suddenly, I was not a superior Englishman who did not want to know them. I was now a real person, just like they were. I began to play a greater part in the life of the school. A staff versus boys football match was arranged that I was invited to play, Unfortunately, the match was scheduled for one o'clock in the afternoon. The sun was blazing down. After about ten minutes, one of the staff thought that I should be allowed to display my skills and pass the ball firmly in my direction. I watched it roll towards me. I tried to move into its path, but I could only watch as it rolled past. I was completely unable to move my legs. I felt dizzy and weak. I staggered as best I could off the pitch and towards a tap outside the pavilion. Getting there eventually, I drenched my body in water and drank several pints. I was suffering from dehydration. 
After that, I asked one of the boys to run up and down the touchline with bottles of water, which I poured over my head at regular intervals. My fellow players did not pass the ball to me any more. I felt I had let everyone down. Wasn't I from the same land as their football heroes, Keegan, Hoddle, Dalgleish and the rest? I thought I might fare better at cricket. However, my medium-paced seam bowling didn't cut much ice. When I tried to bat, the ball came through so fast that I didn't see it at all. However, it was when I tried to field a ball that had been hit hard along the ground that I realised that my reactions were just too slow. The outfield was a desert, littered with rocks. The ball travelled an uneven path towards me and reared up over my head after bouncing off a rock just in front of me. It carried on its crazy path towards the boundary. Again, I had let down the side. This time it was the side of Botham, Gower, Gooch and Willis. No wonder the English team was being blackwashed by the team from the Caribbean, for this was the very school that had produced Michael Holding, the great West Indian fast bowler, and here, on the same ground on which the latter had honed his lightning reactions, was an Englishman demonstrating his absolute inferiority on the field. I was still anxious to impress upon mine host that the white man could do something useful, even if he could not play ball. So I offered to play my saxophone at speech day. This turned out to be a tedious, institutionalised event which allowed self-important old boys to drone on endlessly about how they had carried the virtues of hard work, self-discipline, thrift, morality, love of God and country into their adult lives, allowing them the luxury of boring everyone to death once a year on speech day. Such pomposity had died out in most parts of England by 1970, but not in Jamaica. Several hours later, the entertainment was brought on. There was the school choir, the string quartet, and the white man playing Misty on the saxophone. The whoop of approval when I had finished my rather nervous performance was something I shall never forget. You have soul, they told me the next day. I was no longer white man, English man, or even teacher. I was someone they wanted to talk to. At last I was addressed by my own name. Alas, it was already time for me to return to England. My year was up. I had not taught very much of anything to anyone, but I had learnt an awful lot about Jamaica and how Jamaicans can take on life and enjoy it in spite of its grittier realities. Chapter 8 The School Play On the resumption of my duties at the now amalgamated school back in Hackney, the head asked me if I'd learnt anything about teaching techniques during my year in Jamaica. I had to tell him that I had not, because techniques in Jamaica reminded me of those that I had experienced as a boy in the 50s, namely chalk, talk and corporal punishment. I found it hard to explain to him exactly what I had learnt. Eventually I found a way of doing it. I had read a novel by Herbert de Lissa called Jane's Career while I had been in Kingston, which described the progress of a young woman from the countryside making her way through Kingston society at the turn of the century. I adapted it for the stage and resolved to put it on at the school. If anyone reading this has ever produced a school play in a secondary school, I know I already have your sympathy. If you haven't, you will find it hard to understand what an epic task 
lay before me. It's not like putting on a play in a repertory theatre or with an amateur dramatic society. In those situations, there are givens. Actors may be temperamental and budgets may be tight, but those involved generally understand what you're trying to do. In a school, you will have to deal with a head who, although he may appreciate the finished article, will view the process of achieving it with the utmost suspicion. You will be dependent on stage managers, lighting technicians and performers who may never have set foot on a stage before. Worst of all, you'll have to deal with the schoolkeeper. Here you will be confronted with a man or woman whose sole purpose in life is to close the school whenever possible. This is a person who will view the invasion of their school after five o'clock by 600 parents and friends of the pupils or outsiders, as they would call them, as nothing short of madness. Before you do anything else, you should start by putting aside a special fund purely for the purpose of bribing the schoolkeeper, for without his or her support there will be no performance, let alone a single rehearsal. Luckily, I had previously fostered good relations with my schoolkeeper by listening to his frequent moans about kids today or the absurd demands placed upon him by the head who insisted on regular parents' evenings and other unnecessary activities. So, after buying him several pints at his favourite pub and noisily running down all his pet hates, he decided that I was, after all, just one of the lads and agreed to set aside three nights for the performance. The students, whom I optimistically cast in their various roles, had never acted before. This was the first school play at Dolster Mount, stroke Kingsland, since, well, as long as anyone could remember. So details such as learning scripts, following stage directions, or even coming to rehearsals were new concepts to my actors. Various would-be starlets came and went, as they realised that the road to thespian glory was paved with the pain of endless, frustrating and often boring rehearsals. However, after nine months of determined effort, during which the performance was rescheduled three times, a valiant team of actors and technicians emerged, ready to give it their all for three glorious nights of drama. Then, and without consulting me, Two of the feistiest actresses chose to give the head some lip after he queried their presence on the school premises during the final dress rehearsal. Outraged and deaf to please, he excluded them for a week. These two girls were the principal players in Act 3 of the four-act drama. I had no alternative but to cut out that act completely and tell that part of the story using the device of a letter home from Jane, which could be read out by her parents on stage. Thus the show went on. Rarely do people with Caribbean connections get a chance to see plays about Jamaica in England. Although there is a lively theatre scene in Kingston, so, when the word got out, the parents, friends and relations of the pupils turned out in large numbers on all three nights. They roared with laughter throughout and gave the actors a powerful ovation at the curtain call. It was all worth it in the end, and finally even the head realised that I really had learnt something on my year away in Jamaica. London, I will find out. Get along